Well, good morning. Welcome to Church at Home with Glory Baptist Church of Aiken, Minnesota. So glad you could join us. If you'd like to know more about us, you can find us online at aikinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N church.com. A couple of quick things, and then we'll get into some prayer and reading of Scripture. Uh, as we do each and every week, we prepare a bulletin that you can find online. Go to the church's website, and we'll have a link in the postings of the sermon and worship videos here so that you can connect to that. And in that, it talks about just various things that are ongoing in our church, even at a distance, socially distanced. We still have all sorts of things going on that we'd love to have you be part of. Uh, this week, the, the featured focus, uh, the spotlight on, is about the Deacons Fund, the Benevolence Fund. Every month, the first Sunday of the month, we have kind of a second, second offering of sorts, and that goes to the Deacons for the Benevolence Fund, and all of those funds are given away. We take that money, we bless others with it. Um, it's a chance for us to encourage people, to serve people, to love people, to help people, to invest in our community. Uh, our deacons are great caretakers of that fund, and they're very generous, and they do a great job of finding ways in which to be a blessing into other people's lives. And so um, we do have that. As you're giving, you can give online right now, or you can also um, send in a check to the church or whatever you would like to do. But if you do the online giving, there is an option to give to the Benevolence Fund specifically if you would like to do uh, a specific offering for that as well. So we have that option set up online if you want to do that. Again, download the bulletin. It has the sermon notes. It's got a weekly call to prayer. If you need a, a list of things that you would like to pray for each day, it's a great place to start a, a daily prayer system from. Um, would encourage you to utilize that. And then, as I said, the sermon notes are in there if you would like those to follow along or to make notes on for future reference. A great place to do that. As you have seen and heard on the news, undoubtedly, the information about the death of George Floyd and then the subsequent ongoing issues that are happening here in Minnesota and across the country uh, related to that. And in the Twin Cities, there's been protests, and then, of course, there's been riots and fires and all kinds of other things going on. And first, we as a people of God are called to be a people of prayer, and we need to pray for that, and we will here in just a moment. I would encourage you to be in prayer. Pray for justice, pray for healing, pray for peace. We also need to grieve. Um, we need to lament and, and share the burden and weight of pain that many who are brothers and sisters in Christ are, are experiencing. And so we need to grieve with them. Part of uh, our responsibility, I think, as Christians and, and leaders is we need to speak up. Um, we need to recognize that there are still problems in this country. There are race problems. There are systematic problems. And um, we need to, when we see those, we need to recognize them and, and name racism for what it is and choose not to be silent. And then we need to educate others as well. Um, many of us come from a position of privilege. Um, yes, I've worked hard all my life and I've earned what I have, but I'm wise enough to know that I am also still privileged to be on that. And we need to use that position and use that advantage that we have been given um, to lead the way in love, to, to preach and teach and, and share with our friends, our family, and the next generations um, that there's a better way forward, that we are all created in God's image. And in that, um, we all bleed red. And so that is what I would encourage you to begin to do. There's lots more that you can do if you would like to be part of helping out. Jubilee Church in the Twin Cities is the church that Matt and Katie Nix were associated with when they were there. Um, they are immediately in the area that's been hit, and they are doing some work there. And I do believe our missions committee is going to be partnering with them. Another great ministry uh, is called Transform Minnesota. You can find them online, um, on Facebook. Uh, a friend of mine, Carl Nelson, uh, directs that ministry. And it's a 
ministry that serves all sorts of different churches across Minnesota, and uh, they've really been leading the way in this area even before this, and so they're really doing a great job of connecting people and resources um, with information of how you can serve and, and what you can do in this moment. Um, I know a number of people watch these sermons are in the Twin Cities, um, whether they're weekenders or, or families with cabins up where we live. And if you're looking for a way to connect, um, Transform Minnesota has a list on their Facebook page as well as their website of what's going on immediately, including tomorrow on Sunday afternoon, uh, whether it's food drop-offs or cleanups and prayer gatherings and other things. Uh, great places for people to plug in. And if you have questions about any of this, some people don't quite understand why this is happening or what's going on, um, I'd love to talk some more with you and, and, and share with you my insights. This is not the right time for that, but uh, would encourage you, be in prayer, reach out to people you know, check in on them, make sure they're doing okay, find ways to love, find, find ways, as I said, to pray, mourn, grieve, speak up, and to educate others. And as we do that, and as we do that as the hands and feet of Christ into the world, uh, I do believe we can move forward and make this uh, a better place to live and a better world to be part of, and we can better glorify God as we make sure people know that they were created in his image. Now we're going to pray, and then I'm going to read some scripture, and then we're going to get into the sermon. Join me for prayer. Father God, there's so much that's been on our minds as a, a nation in this time. This past week has had all sorts of things going on that can be incredibly frightening, can be very disconcerting, can be very disorientating. And God, we just pray in this moment. Indeed, we pray for justice. Uh, certainly, God, we pray for healing. And, and God, we pray for peace. All of these things are things that we need. And you are the one and only source that could bring that about. God, we just pray that you would guide us as a people, guide us as a state, and guide us as a nation in all of that. And God, we pray that as people created in your image, that we could be bridge builders, that we could be people who love, that we could be people who reach out, that we could be people who make a difference in this world. Lord, give us the courage to speak out where we see injustice. Lord, make us brave to stand against things that are wrong. And God, help us lead the way in that each and every day. And as we do so, may we continue to make much of you. Lord, we also pray in this time of the COVID crisis, because there's other things going on as well, for your protection for all who are working and serving on our behalf. Be it the National Guard, the police, the sheriffs, be it nurses and doctors, staff at medical facilities, people working in nursing homes, pharmacies, people working in frontline jobs as EMTs and other positions, God. We just pray for all of them and your protection for them. Lord, there's many uh, associated with our church and in our broader church family who we have health concerns that we are praying for. We lift them up to you, knowing, God, that you are the healer, God. And God, there's always much in this world that is not as it's supposed to be, not as you created it to be. And we know, Lord, that's the result of sin, that sin has entered into this world. It's broken it. We as humans have broken it. But the good news is you didn't want it to be that way, and you're not going to allow it to stay that way, that you sent Jesus into the world to live a life we could not live, to die a death we could not die, that he might go to the cross and take away the sins of the world and he would conquer sin and death in the grave and rise after three days to sit again at your right hand. And God, we thank you for that so much, for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you that you are a relational God that reaches out to us, a God who will continue to forgive us if only we would turn to you, confess our sins, and accept your forgiveness. God, we thank you for that. Continue to be with us in this time of worship. 
We praise you in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name. Amen. Well, a couple of passages of scripture that I would like to read for you are going to be the passages that I'll actually be using in the sermon. And the first passage is one that we started with last week. It's Genesis 1, 1 and 2. There it reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Second passage I would like to share comes from Jeremiah 4, 22 and 23. This is an interesting one, and, and you'll understand when I get to it in the sermon, I'll give some more context for it. And there it reads, For my people are foolish, they know me not. They are stupid children, they have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil, but how to do good they know not. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. And then the last one is Matthew 25, 29, and 30. This is the parable of the talents, and it. it's the tail end of that story. And it says, For everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping, and gnashing of teeth. This is God's Word. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in Genesis 1 1 once again this week, uh, looking at primarily Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, actually. And, and as we started last week, this study of the book of Genesis, we learned that Genesis means origins or beginnings, and that this basically lays the groundwork not only for the next book, which is Exodus but it lays the groundwork for all of the rest of scripture. The principles, the foundation that is set forth uh, in this book is, is there to build upon for all and everything else that we find in the rest of the books of the Bible. The book, of course, begins with God's creation of the world, uh, but its early chapters record, in addition to the creation of the world, three low points uh, in primeval history. It records the fall, the flood, and then the incident at the Tower of Babel. And each instance, uh, God responds to those low points, both in judgment as well as in grace. So from the very beginning of God's dealing with us uh, in recorded history in the book of Genesis, both his justice and his mercy are there. Both his judgment and his grace are set forth. The book of Genesis, as we said last week, can be divided into basically two large parts. The first 11 chapters record for us primeval history, all of the history before the time of the patriarchs, and, and then beginning with Genesis 12 and running all the way through the end of the book in Genesis chapter 50, uh, we have a record of the patriarchal history. So, so primeval history in that first 11 chapters and then patriarchal history from chapter 12 through chapter 50, uh, the end of the book. And that, of course, means then in, when we get into the patriarchal history part, uh, we start off with Abraham, and then we go through his sons and his descendants, and then from uh, Genesis 12 and on, we, we look at these kind of foundational or, or patriarchal families that we follow this family line through the rest of the Bible. This book of Genesis, especially in its first section, is, is really designed to remind us uh, of a number of, of central truths. And, and first of all, within that, uh, is that God is the one who created the world and that he is distinct from the world. Uh, we also learn that, that God shaped his creation from formlessness into order. And that's what we're going to be focusing primarily on today. The first chapters of Genesis are also meant to remind us that, that man and his sin and rebellion is completely responsible for the current state of things in the world with regard to its corruption and brokenness. Genesis makes it abundantly clear that, that the world which God created was good, and it was by man's rebellion that we brought brokenness into the world. So instead of blaming God for the way things are now, Genesis, Genesis makes it, it clear that, that man is responsible for the fall and for the corruption uh, of the original creation. And of course, 
Within that, then we see God's character being revealed as he responds to this problem of sin and these various low points of, of the fall and the flood and the incident at the Tower of Babel. We see in that then God's justice and, and his mercy are, are set forth here in the book of Genesis. Now last week, um, we, we started to look at Genesis 1.1, and this week we'll finish it up. And, and you might be going, well, why, why two weeks on this one chapter, Pastor? And the reason for that, frankly, is because it's one of the most important verses in all of the Bible. And everything else hinges on truths that we find here. So spending just a, a little bit of extra time uh, on this passage is well worth our time. So let's look again at those first two verses that we find in Genesis chapter 1 then. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 say this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. These first two verses of Genesis bring us face to face with ultimate reality. That, that God, who creates heaven and earth, is the creator and, and is greater than the creation. The reality that, that God is the creator makes us therefore then as creation answerable to him. The first thing that I want to stress is that we as Christians should appreciate the implications of Genesis 1 with regard to the account of the origins of the world. Scientists and philosophers call the study of origins of our world cosmogony. And Genesis 1 gives us a biblical cosmogony, a biblical view of how the world was brought into being. And we as Christians should not avoid reflecting upon the implications of what Genesis 1 says about the origins of the world. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Christian account, the Judeo-Christian account of creation the biblical account of creation is not intellectually disadvantaged in the modern world. Don't think that there is some agreed upon alternative opinion to the Christian doctrine of creation. There's not. In fact, last week we said there's really only three total views out there. Uh, the other views are you can believe that there was nothing and then there was everything. There was something at least, right? And, and for most people, that going from nothing to something, from lack to being, making that leap from one to the other is more than most people are willing to take on. It's a tough pill to swallow. Or you can, of course, believe the other alternative that somehow, some way, some shape or form, there's always been something, right? That, that matter is eternal. And that, that somehow matter became more organized and exploded into a greater reality than it had ever had at, at any point in the misty past of eternity. And that somehow there's this primordial blob that then became, became the world that we have. And now there's, there's, there's problems with that, that view, right? There's at least two, but there's probably more. And the big problem, the big question is, well then, if there was this matter that became the primordial blob, that became everything that we know in space and time, where then did that come from, right? Where did everything come from? And you know when somebody says, well, it's, it's always just been there, right? I go, no, hold on a second. I want to know if it exists, it came from somewhere. I want to know where that thing came from, where that thing with all of the potentiality for all of the universe, I want to know where did it come from? Who made it? What made it? Where did all that stuff come from in the first place? 
and it's always just been there, is not a satisfactory answer. Now, I as a Christian have an answer for that. But those who would propose that it's just always been there, they can't really answer that question. And so we must not think that, that somehow the, the Christian view of the world has been exploded because it hasn't. And it's also interesting to, to, to look at the, the objections that are raised against the things that we believe as Christians, uh, the, the views that we have, the people who disagree with those, it's interesting to examine the grounds on which they have problems with what we believe. For instance, some people have a hard time believing in, a, in an omnipotent, all-powerful creator who, who brought the world into being, right? But let me ask you this. If the world as we know it and all of the universe came into being through the atomic sequences resulting in and coming from interactions out of this primordial blob, in this blob of matter that they want to say that's always been there, doesn't then that, that blob of matter have all power and potentiality in it? I mean, if it, if it has that power and potentiality in it, I mean, shouldn't we fall down and worship it then? I mean, it has effectively all of the things, for the most part, other than personality and relationality that God has. But yet people will object to the, the Christian doctrine of God. And so as we go out into the intellectual marketplace, uh, the place of ideas, our ideas as believers, when we say that we believe that there was a, a time where, where, where nothing in, of the universe existed, but God existed, and then that, that God brought matter into being, we're not arguing a position that is philosophically untenable or, or even a little bit disrespectful intellectually. We have a good place to argue our point of view in the world today. And, and, and that reminds us of, of the whole system of naturalistic atheism in particular and how its thinking is in crisis today. There are all sorts of people in the world who are asking questions, and questions about the very nature of Darwinism and, and the evolutionary assumptions that, that have come and bubbled up from it. And even those who, who hold to that particular view recognize that there are enormous problems inherent in them. And let me say philosophically and, and religiously, there's even greater problems as we look at that. For instance, uh, let me give you an example. There, there's no idea that is more pervasive in our society today than the fact that all people and all ideas are created equal, right? That they must be treated with equal respect and equal value under the law, not simply as a, a convention of, of political ideology, but as a rock-solid fact of the reality of nature. But, friends, let me tell you, if there is no God, if there is no divine lawgiver, if we are not created in God's image, well, then I want to ask a question. How then is it that we arrived at this idea that all people are equal? I mean, if we simply evolved from some primordial blob, who's to say that, that my group of people who evolved from the blob, blob aren't better than your group of people, right? That, that we evolved better than you somehow. I mean, after all, we were just all part of the blob to begin with, but, but maybe I was somehow advantaged. Maybe I was at a better part of the blob than your family was, and so now my family's better than your family because we're just better because that's the way we evolved, Right? And, and maybe if that's the case, then maybe there's more in my family and there's more people and maybe we're stronger and, and, and maybe my people have better technology and we've got better weapons and maybe we can force our views on you, on your group, because you're just not as good as we are. Who's to say that we are not inherently better than you then? 
You see, there's, there's people who want to argue, let's leave God out of this, right? We all just evolved from this blob. But they still want to believe that all people are, are equal. And you can't have your cake and eat it too. You've either got to reject this idea that, that, that all people have inherent rights, that, that all people must, must be treated as if they are created in the image of God, because that's basically what they're saying. You've either got to reject that and accept the fact then that, yes, we've evolved better than you and we're better than you. Or you have to accept that there is some outside presence, some divine lawgiver, as we as Christians would say, that has created us in his image so that we are of equal value, we are of equal worth. Without God, there is no foundation for morality. But as Christians, Genesis 1 reminds us that all of mankind has been created and invested with the image of God. Another thing that the, the very first verse of Genesis reminds us of is the creator and the creation distinction. And that is against all views that confuse that, that God is somehow the world. The philosophers would call that pantheism. You may have heard that term before. That belief that, that the world is God and that, the, that God is somehow the world. And contrary to all views that God and the world are the same or are identified as part of one another, the Genesis account reminds us that God is not the world. He's not part of the world. And the world is not in any way God. God made the world. He's active and involved in the world, but he is not the world. And whenever we begin to confuse that very simple and basic fact, we get off track and get into trouble. God is distinct from his creation. He brought it into being as Lord over it, and he alone has the right to make the laws for it, and he is the, the all-powerful personal being. And this is part of the beauty of the Genesis account. The Lord is an all-powerful personal being, and he brought the world into being. And he made the universe, and the creation reflects him. And because he is real, and because he is personal, the creation reflects his meaning. The created order that he has made is not meaningless. Creation is filled with meaning. We live in a, a day and age where there are a lot of people who want to believe that there is no God who brought the world into being. That this world just always has been. It's a spectacular world. It's a marvelous world. It's an intricate world. There are lots of amazing things about it. But it's not a personal world for them. It's, it's, so to speak, an intricate mechanism, but the world doesn't have a relationship with me because the world isn't planned, it isn't organized, it's just some random connection of random strings of DNA, right? It just is. That's just the way it is, right? Well, it's interesting, and, and, and it may sound like a, a good argument in some classroom somewhere. But when the rubber meets the road in real life, that system is not a good system. It sounds good intellectually in a classroom, but it fails miserably, for instance. When you have to go meet a family at a funeral parlor, when they're laying their son or their daughter or their husband or wife to rest. And you have to look them in the eyes and say, yeah, there's no meaning to any of this anyhow, so big deal. Why, why are you whining? Why are you complaining, right? Because there's no meaning to any of this, right? That's not a satisfactory worldview, that there's no meaning. 
we created in the image of God, we know inherently that there is meaning, even when we rebel against it. Again, this can all sound good in a classroom, but in real life, it just leaves you wanting. The trials and the tragedies and the triumphs of our life, they, they actually have meaning because there's a God who has ordered the world and supplied it with meaning and made it to work in the way in which it works. But again, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that, no, there's, there's no God. That's just the way it is. But yet there's still meaning. You can't have it both ways. And that's why Genesis 1-1 matters so much. Genesis 1-1 is, is such an important verse of the Bible. Because the world is the way that it is, because God made it that way. A personal God who relates to us and who cares about us. That's who made the world. That's who gives us meaning. Genesis 1-1 makes all the difference in the world. This isn't just stuff for theologians and philosophers to speculate on in some you know, dusty book or in some faraway seminary classroom or whatever. This is the stuff of day-to-day -day life. Genesis 1-1 is relevant for each and every one of us. And separated from this truth, the rest of reality, then it doesn't make any sense if we don't have a firm foundation and understanding of who God is and how he created and why that gives us meaning and why that matters. There's another thing that I'd like us to see today. And you'll see that in verse 2, if you're following along. I want you to look at the way God moves his original creation from, from disorganization to organization. Look at verse 2 there. Look at what the nature of the, the, the primordial matter, the first matter that God brought into being. Look at what it looks like here in the very first stage of creation. Read verse 2 along with me. The, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Here in verse 2, we, we see the chaos of the first matter and God's gradual beginning of forming it into creation that we now know. And I want you to notice three characteristics of, of the original creation that, that are put there for you in verse 2. The original creation is formless, right? It's, it's void or it's empty and it's dark. I mean, look at these words. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face or over the surface of the deep. It was formless and it was empty. That's what the original creation was like. And it was dark. Those three characteristics, formless, empty, dark, are the nature of this first matter that, that God has brought into being. It is without form. It's empty. It's chaotic. It's void. It's barren. It's dark. And it's very interesting that, that in the visions of judgment in the Bible, judgment comes when God returns the current order to a state of chaos, to emptiness, to darkness. Let me give you a couple examples of that. If you want, you could turn to uh, Jeremiah 4 in your Bibles. And here in Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah is talking about the evil of Israel and what God does in response to that evil. Jeremiah was one of the Old Testament prophets. And Israel, the nation of Israel, had done some bad things, as they frequently did in the Old Testament. And, and Jeremiah is talking about God's response to that in Jeremiah 4, verses 22 and 23. Listen to what he says about the way Israel is acting. And listen to what he says about what God is going to do about it as his judgment. 
He says, for my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. But how to do good, they know not. I looked on the earth and behold, it was without form and void. And to the heavens, they had no light. So what is God's judgment against wickedness? A return, so to speak, to a created order that does not evidently bear the stamp of his image. Formlessness, emptiness, darkness. Jesus picks up on this as well. Uh, you may remember some of these from the book of Matthew. In Matthew 8, and Matthew 20, and Matthew 25, Jesus speaks about darkness, right? And in Matthew 25, verse 30, for instance, he says that those who do not use the talents which the Lord has given them for his glory and for the good of his people, they will, as Jesus says in Matthew 25, chapter 30, be thrown into outer darkness and into that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now let me say really quickly that, that Genesis is not implying that the original creation was bad. But it's reminding us that, that one of the blessings of God was the taking of that original creation and forming it into order and fullness and light. And so that, that withdrawal of that order of, of fullness and light is a sign of losing God's blessing. He gives you a gift, you reject it, and you rebel against him. And then what does he do? He takes it away. And so throughout the scriptures, you will see this in Isaiah 34 and in other passages too, the prophets will take us right back here to Genesis 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. And they will speak of God's judgment in terms of God withdrawing the blessing of form and fullness and light. And then notice there in verse 2 as well that in the midst of this empty and, and formlessness, this dark place that that the Spirit of God is actually already there at work. We see God at work even in that. He is the, the first mover. God is at work already in this primordial chaos. The Spirit of God is already at work in the process of the shaping of creation. This passage here in Genesis 1 verse 2 reminds us that God will turn the, the formless mass into a well-formed and ordered world. And that's basically what's going to happen throughout the days of creation. In the six days of, of creation, God orders this chaos into form. God crafts from formlessness, form. From emptiness, fullness. From darkness, light. And that's also a picture of how God works actually in our hearts. It's not a mistake that Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts has been called by the, the, the Spirit uh, recreation. That we are recreated in God's image. That we are born again and created anew. Because what the Spirit does in our hearts parallels what God does in, in bringing form from formlessness, fullness from emptiness. And one last quick little thing before I close here. We need to appreciate the significance of the order, the, the structure of creation. If we were to read from Genesis 1 verse 3 all the way to Genesis 2, 3, we would have for, for ourselves there a, a small a short little scope describing the seven days of creation. The six days in which God created and the Sabbath day in which he rests, right? Look at that passage just very briefly. And scan that with your eyes if you still got your Bible open on your phone or you're looking at your, your, your print Bible. Scan, scan that along with me. Let me point you to a couple of quick, quick verses. Because I want you to note that, that where Genesis 1-2 says that the earth was formless, Days one, two, and three are then devoted to giving the world form. You see that there? 
And then if you look at verses 3 to verse 10, you'll see that each of those days speaks of God shaping the world, ordering it into form out of formlessness. Then you could look at verse 11 through 13, but especially verses 14 through 31, you see that that fullness is, is brought into creation. And while the creation was originally empty, God brings it to fullness. Days four, five, and six are all devoted to that. And, and you'll notice if you're looking at it that, that one, two, and three are devoted, devoted to form. Four, five, and six are devoted to fullness. And the first day of form and the first day of fullness, you see what they're both devoted to? The creation of light. So from formlessness and emptiness and darkness, God brings into creation order and fullness and light. And so he impresses upon creation the stamp of his own character. And that's why Psalm 19 can say that the the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Because his order and his fullness and his light have been built into the creation as we see and experience. And, And within that then, every single day cries out for his glory. That's why the Apostle Paul can say in Romans chapter 1 that that, that we see in the creation the reality of God. It testifies that he is the maker of the heavens and the earth and that we ought to worship him. God is the creator and we are part of that creation. And because of that, we should worship him. Keep that in mind this week. Thank God this week for his creation and for all that he has done for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage. It's such a beautiful passage and it's so basic, yet so deep. Lord, a lot of times we we just kind of make assumptions about so many of these things. And God, this week I pray that you would press upon us and, and help us not take these words for granted. Especially in a mocking and cynical world that has taken you for granted so many times. Lord, we praise you. And we pray that you would help us to articulate with grace and with love our absolute confidence in your truth, that you are the creator God, and we as your creation should worship you. And God, as we do that, may we truly give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor that you and you alone deserve. Lord, help us do that this week. Make us aware of the splendor of your glory. Give us a moment of awe, perhaps. Maybe it's the song of a bird, the wind in the trees, a sunrise or a sunset, a bumblebee or a hummingbird or whatever it is, Lord. And as we see it, may we know that it is part of your creation and that it is intended to be good. And we are thankful for it. And then God, as all of us, as your image bearers, We praise you that you are in relationship with us. We thank you that in your created order, you created us and you wanted to be in relationship with us, each and every one of us. And God, if somebody hasn't heard it before, may they hear it today. Jesus loves each and every one of us. He wants to be in relationship with us. And God, if somebody doesn't know what that means, wants to know more, Lord, encourage them, give them the boldness to reach out and to ask some questions that we might share more about that with them. But God, each and every one of us as creations, we are your image bearers. So we have value and we have worth because you love us. We thank you for that. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Continue to be with us. 
It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, again, I'm so glad that you've taken a little bit of time out of your busy schedule to join us here at Glory Baptist Church for worship. It's a blessing to be able to share God's word with you. And if we can love you, serve you, pray for you, be a blessing into your life in some way, shape, or form, please let us know. You can drop us a comment, give us a call, send us a letter, whatever it is. Let us know how we might serve you. It is a blessing and a delight and a joy that we can serve others around us. God has abundantly blessed us, and we want to use that to be a blessing to others. This week, find a way to connect with God. Make much of him everywhere you go. Wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. And we hope to see you soon. Stay awesome, and God bless.